it's my pleasure to be hosting this talk, which is the latest in our series where we meet some of the specialists behind the project of conserving the Elizabeth Tower. Tonight, you'll be meeting Philippa McDonnell, Andrianne and Clara Coates, two research fellows and conservators from Lincoln Conservation. Philippa, hello to you. Hi, Louise. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Uh, Philippa is a conservator and architectural paint researcher at Lincoln Conservation. Following a BA in Art History at Warwick University, she completed her graduate diploma and AHRC funded internship and masters at the University of Lincoln in 2015. She worked as an archivist for the Royal Household Property Section before taking up a full time role at Lincoln Conservation. Her interests include digital heritage and the research and conservation of historic interiors with a particular focus on wallpaper and 19th century painted decoration. She is currently part of the working group creating EU standards for investigation and documentation of built heritage finishes and is undertaking a PhD in late 19th century house paints. So again, very, very welcome to you, Philippa. And now hello to you, Rhiannon. Hello. Hello, Rhiannon, hello. Um, Rhiannon is an accredited easel paintings conservator at Lincoln Conservation. She completed her BA in conservation restoration at De Montfort University and her MA in the conservation of fine art at the University of Northumbria. Rhiannon has over 16 years experience in the commercial conservation sector, where she's worked on projects in iconic properties such as Hampton Court Palace, the British Museum and Stowe School. She is an assessor for the v Stoke Icon Conservation and Collection Care Technicians Diploma. She's part of the Lincolnshire Diocesan Advisory Committee for the Care of Churches and is a committee member of the Icon Paintings Group. So as you've heard, we're in expert hands this evening. So a very warm welcome again to both Philippa and Rhiannon. Now, I have a lot of questions to ask you both about your Elizabeth Tower work. But before I do that, to give our audience some background information, can you give us an overview of the kind of work Lincoln Conservation does? And then we'll look at specific examples. And let's go in alphabetical order. Philippa, let's go with you first. And then if you pass over to Rhiannon to tell us more. Yeah, so uh, at Lincoln Conservation, we're actually housed in the University of Lincoln. So uh, we work on uh, built heritage, doing conservation, restoration and research. Um, so not just uh, researching uh, paint and wallpapers, but also conserving it as well. And again, because we're part of the university, we also work with uh, with students as well and help with student experience. Um, so we tend to look at built finishes. So that's things like paint, wallpaper, um, gilding, uh, but we also do um, object conservation as well. Fantastic. And Rihanna? So I tend to um, work mainly with uh, the conservation of easel paintings, conservation, but also um, paintings in an architectural setting. So canvases marouflaged on walls or painted ceilings in historic homes um, palaces, castles, that, that, churches, that sort of thing. Um, and also the sort of um, painted uh, polychromy and decorative surfaces in an architectural setting. Um, and uh, so uh, we do that as a sort of commercial conservation uh, enterprise, um, as think of conservation, but we also do um, academic research and we also provide um, quite a lot of um, work experience opportunities for recent conservation graduates or, or current students uh, on our sort of live projects. That's wonderful. I think we'll see some of those again later. So thank you very much, Rhiannon. Um, let's see some specific examples that I promised. So Philippa, one of your interests we heard is in historic wallpaper. Can you tell us more about this slide, which includes that? Yeah, so uh, this slide just on the left hand side, uh, we've got some wallpaper um, here. This is probably from the late 19th, uh, uh, sorry, late 18th, early 19th century. And um, uh, and you can see we've got a machine holding up against it. This is called an XRF machine, which um, 
basically shoots x-rays at it and tells us what elements are in it. Um, a lot of wallpaper and a lot of paints have um, some what we now know are quite dangerous chemicals in them. Um, so we're shooting it at this, uh, at this green pigment here, which is actually a pigment made from um, copper and um, arsenic as well. So uh, when we're looking at decorative surfaces, we kind of when we're archiving them, we want to we want to make sure that they're safe and conserve them. But we also want to make sure that our conservators are safe as well. So uh, we do a lot of testing to make sure that uh, that we know what's in them and we know how to store them sort of properly and safely as well. And the, the slide on the right, what can we see there, the picture on the right? Um, the, the slide on the right is um, is uh, conservation of an easel painting that uh, we had one of our interns uh, do. So uh, Rhiannon um, is an accredited easel painting conservator and you can see here we're just uh, removing some varnish. So you can see that the, some of the discoloured oxidised varnish is uh, really sort of disfiguring the, the the colour of the paint underneath. So you can see you've got that the blue sky on the on the left hand side and you can see where um, our intern is removing with with a swab. The varnish has really sort of uh, made it look really sort of almost sort of greenish yellow. Um, so we're, we're removing that to allow us to see how it how it originally looked. Oh, well, thank you. It sounds like wallpapering years ago with the arsenic content was a bit of a dangerous profession. But um, Philippa, I, I know Lincoln Conservation have worked on many historic buildings and we'll see some examples shortly of those too. But can you tell us about this slide? Yeah, so uh, this is a very typical uh, site project that we do. Um, so this is actually in a um, in a church in Camden in London, um, and it's around the same sort of period as as the Elizabeth Tower would have been as well. So that kind of a, a mid to late nineteenth century, um, and uh, and again it's in a, a Gothic revival style, so similar to to the Elizabeth Tower as well. Um, so here there was just a lot of uh, dirt build up. If you imagine in a church, you've got um, candle smoke and and just general dirt over the last sort of 100 or so years build up so it was our job to get right up to the ceiling which was about 25 meters up um, uh, get scaffolding out there um, and clean away that dirt and also make sure that any of the paint that's starting to flake off is um, sort of adhered back to the surface so we don't lose any of that and then any of the, the paint that has been lost we'll retouch that in so you can kind of read the decorative surface a little bit better and and bring it back to how how it once looked Oh, well, thank you. Sounds like you definitely have to have a head for heights in your job as well. Um, now, staying with Philippa, digital heritage is also one of your specialities. Can you tell us what's going on in this photograph? Yeah, so um, we've been dig doing digital heritage for uh, the last sort of uh, 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 five years or so, but uh, we've really seen it sort of uh, take hold uh, during COVID. So um, as well as doing our normal sort of laser scans as well, we also do uh, what's called sort of more of an immersive scan. Um, and this allows us to build a really sort of um, user friendly model uh, that can be um, essentially walked around a bit like Google Maps, but for buildings. Um, and this is what this model is here. So um, it can be accessed on, on a web browser and, uh, and anyone, whether that's members of the public or or, um, the teams who had to work in historic buildings remotely um, could then kind of continue their continue their work. Um, so that's that's a really really useful part of, of digital heritage there. And it's amazing to see these large buildings kind of on your screen in a sort of more sort of a movable way. Yeah, that's absolutely beautiful. So thank you. That's really informative. So we're going to go on to Rhiannon now because uh, we've heard you're an accredited easel paintings conservator and an assessor for the VNA Stroke Icon Conservation and Collection Care Technicians Diploma. And I understand, Rhiannon, that you and Philippa also teach your specialisms to students, as illustrated in this slide. So tell us more about what we can see in this. Um, in this particular image on the slide, um, this is um, me working with one of our interns. Um, she was a, a graduate um, from the master's programme in the conservation of cultural heritage. Um, and this uh, particular uh, student, she uh, practised as a paintings conservator in her home country of Taiwan. Um, but she has been working with me in the studio quite extensively, learning um, the techniques of um, conservation of Northern European easel paintings, which pose some different uh, dilemmas. Um, they respond differently, they're made with different materials. And um, it's been a really great learning experience for her. Um, she now is working with us on quite a regular basis in, in the 
capacity as a freelance uh, paintings conservator. And so it's been a lovely opportunity working with somebody, learning from uh, people from other countries and different, slightly different disciplines. So um, it, you know, it's a really rewarding part of our, our job. And we do um, work with people at all different levels and, uh, of experience and at sort of various stages in their career. So yeah, it's, it's a very enjoyable part of our work. Oh, well, thank you so much. And it must be wonderful to pass on your fantastic skills to uh, other people as well. And it's been wonderful too to uh, see and hear about the range of work you both cover. So thank you so much for telling us about that. Now, let's have a look at some of the previous projects you and the team have worked on. Uh, Philippa, could you tell us a little bit about these two projects we can see on the screen here, please? Yeah, so these two projects are um, architectural paint research projects, so uh, similar work to what we did at, um, at the Elizabeth Tower. Um, so even though we normally work on a lot of interiors um, and buildings, we also work on exteriors and things that aren't really or you wouldn't normally classify as buildings. Um, so uh, the one on the left is um, the old Royal, Royal Naval College down in Greenwich. Um, so we did some work on the on the colonnades, kind of um, seeing how they used to be painted um, on, on the underside um, there. And again, this helps um, uh, give people options of uh, how to repaint them if, if they want to, how to care for them. Also, if paint's failing to kind of understand what's going on there. And also if any paint has any hazardous materials in to, to understand that and see and see that from a health and safety point of view as well. Um, and then on the on the right hand side, we've got HMS Trincomalee. Um, so again, uh, ships pose a completely uh, different problem because they're sort of buildings and sort of objects. They're kind of like objects that you live in or floating buildings um, and they get moved around a lot as well. So a lot of work on our work there isn't just um, trying to see how it looked like, but also trying to work out the archaeology of it, see which parts are original, which parts were replaced and, and when as well. So the paint can hold a lot of answers um, for a lot of different questions. Oh, well, thank you. I didn't realise you were working on uh, ships as well, so <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and Rhiannon, um, I understand you've also worked inside this next building, so what are we seeing here? Uh, this is a, a sort of current project of mine. It's, um, uh, I started uh, as early as uh, 2016 and it's uh, sort of uh, an ongoing project that's now forming part of my, um, my PhD research. Um, this uh, space that you can see in the central image, this is the upper landing of the east staircase in Stowe House in Buckinghamshire. And um, this space, as you can see, is sort of quite a plain magnolia with white joinery and cornice. And the image on the left is a, is a shot of the ceiling above it. Um, now, it wasn't really clear what this space was. Uh, you know, the interiors of Stowe are, are very grand, um, but this uh, is a slightly odd space. And um, uh, during um, a, an earlier conservation campaign of a neighbouring ceiling, we were given the opportunity to undertake some investigations into the walls. Um, in a in a raking light, so with a sort of oblique angle and the slight casting of shadows, very slight um, outlines of some niches were visible. And so we sketched out what we thought we could see and through careful analysis of the paint layers and very careful exposures, which you can see on the right here in this image on the right, we've um, uncovered this almost complete uh, scheme of wall paintings that date to about 1740s. Um, and my research is um, looking at uh, possible um, artists that may have um, executed this uh, scheme of wall paintings. And it's possibly William Kent or Francesco Sleater who painted the ceiling above the staircase. And um, I, it's it's sort of um, pulling together archival research, but also material analysis. So never underestimate a magnolia wall uh, and what might uh, be contained uh, therein. Um, and it really helps us to sort of understand the development of buildings. And, that's, you know, also a reminder that even though something is hidden, it's it's not necessarily irretrievable. 
Oh, that's lovely. I sadly don't think I'd have anything like that under my Magnolia walls, but really beautiful work. So uh, thank you for the overview, Rhiannon. Now, let's go back to Philippa for an explanation of our next slide. Um, yeah, so uh, this is again, even though we normally work on on paint and a lot of what we do is called paint research that actually um, includes wallpaper as well. Um, so this is an after image of the work we did um, at a small uh, Welsh farm set called Iriskern. Um, and this was the family home of Hedwin, who's a really important um, Welsh national language poet um, who was killed in the Battle of Passchendaele in, in 1917. So um, Snowdonia National Park Trust, um, who uh, now have ownership of the building, were looking to um, try and, and save this building, restore it and, and figure out which sort of era to, to take it back to, because it's got an incredible story. Um, obviously, Hedwin is one of the most famous documents, but also his sister and his family um, were, were um, really um, interesting as well. And it tells an incredible um, social history as well of, of a sort of a middle class family in uh, in Wales during that during that period. Um, so we were really lucky when we went to do some research there. We actually found tucked behind a cupboard about 26 layers of wallpaper. Um, and this is quite rare because if you imagine redecorating at home, you'll tend to you know strip the wallpaper off the walls first before you repaint it. So to actually find all this surviving is is really exciting. And what was even better was that um, this area of wallpaper still had its salvage edges on so it's very sort of end of roll area which had a pattern number on which allowed us to date it quite exactly um, and all those layers built up we could uh, manage to identify the layer that would have been on the walls when Hedwin uh, left home for the very last time and, and never really came back. Um, so it's a great way to kind of uh, to um, bring the cottage back to a certain period and, and kind of really show it in its sort of home colours. Um, so we were really lucky that we worked with a, a great company called Bruce's Fine Paper who um, cut new woodcuts and allowed us to reproduce this wallpaper in, in the traditional way it would have been re, uh, reproduced. Well, thank you so much. And I'm really glad that I left it to you to correctly pronounce the name of the ship and the Welsh site. I'm sure yeah. there's lots of Welsh speakers who will be rolling their eyes at my really rubbish pronunciation. So apologies. <laughs> well, to I, everyone there. I was very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, the, the reason why <laughs> Philip and Rhiannon are, are here this evening is to talk about their fascinating work on the paintwork of the Elizabeth Tower. So let's hear more now about your research project work on this. We can see in this watercolour sketch from the architect Charles Barry his original design of 1838 for the tower's clock face. And it's blue with a row of white shields with a red cross of St George on them above. This looks very different from the more familiar colour scheme that we've been used to seeing, as you can see here. And this started in the mid 1930s and became familiar with its black and gold theme, chosen it's believed to better mask the effects of London's pollution. Notice too the shields above the clock face because these have been painted black and gold rather than the red and white in Barry's sketch. Now we can see Philippa looking down a microscope and let's hear from Philippa and Rhiannon about their research project on the Tower's historic paint schemes. Philippa, tell us what you're looking at in this slide. Um, so under the microscope, we're actually looking at uh, tiny samples of paint that were that were taken from the clock face. Um, so uh, part of what we needed to do was to um, see if Barry's original design was actually carried out or if it was just something that he liked to have done but wasn't actually carried out um, and also see how it's changed over the years. We didn't know how many times it had been painted or or whether um, whether it changed quite significantly in between what we can see now and what we thought Barry might have painted originally. So uh, I'm actually looking at, at tiny samples of paint. Uh, the samples we take are normally about a centimetre or less in, in, in sort of size um, and so we have to look at them uh, mic microscopically um, and we look at them we take a sample right from the very recent uh, sample of paint uh, all the way down a bit like taking a biopsy or a kind of geological sample uh, from the paint right down to the substrate it was painted on so that we know we've, we've captured kind of as full history as, as we possibly can um, of that clock face. Okay, it's interesting actually compare it to a biopsy or taking um, you know, boreholes in geology, for example, to see the historic layers. But does every sample have the same amount of layers then? 
Uh, not always. Uh, sometimes uh, some areas were painted more frequently just in terms of maintenance codes. Um, and sometimes also we're just really unlucky and we've taken a sample from somewhere where a piece of paint has flaked off. Uh, if you kind of look at any walls, sometimes there's just a small bit of paint that's missing. Um, either it's just flicked off for poor condition or maybe it's got knocked in, in some way. Um, so if we're really unlucky, we'll take a sample from an area that's got, you know, some paint missing just or, it, or it's been stripped or, or removed or something like that. So uh, that's one of the reasons that we take so many uh, paint samples from everywhere. One, so that we can uh, try and get um, get a sample from every single area so we can see how every bit's uh, been painted and we don't have to guess so much. And two, so that we know that if there is something missing, we can make a good sort of a guess of why that is. Has it just been accidentally knocked off or was it actually not painted? So I think from just from the, the clock face and the surround, so just that kind of main bit you can see, we took something like 152 samples, I think. So. Uh, yeah, every every area of that has been uh, truly sort of picked over. <laughs> <laughs> well covered. And did you and Rhiannon go up the tower to collect the samples yourselves? Um, we actually uh, didn't. We worked really closely with the conservators who were working there at the time. Uh, everything obviously has to be done to to a certain uh, a certain schedule, and they had to get in before uh, any sort of. Uh, we had to collect this paint before any stripping work um, was was undertaken. Um, but the, we work with uh, Cliveden Conservation really regularly, and uh, and we have a really good sort of trust relationship with them. And um, the person who took them had done paint research previously, so uh, there's a there's quite a neat. Uh, a good technique of, of how to take everything take a sample so that it all stays together and you get the full sample so we knew that they knew how to do it and they they fully documented it uh, there were a lot of a lot of images and a lot of a lot of labels that came along with these paint samples so everything was was really fully documented yeah there's a lot of documentation as well i would think well thank you very much for that so we can actually see one of the um, sample slides that philippa was looking at on this uh, picture here and if you look to the right you can see a blurred image on a screen of that sample so let's have a closer look at a few more samples. Uh, Philippa is the one on the right an example of an area where not so many layers are seen the one you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so um, I don't know if people can see because the writing is quite small, but um, there's a, a little sort of a, a dot right at the bottom that says 1B. Uh, and that's because uh, we're actually missing the very first layer of that. Um, and the reason for that is that this sample was taken from the minute hand on the clock face. Um, so the minute hand that you see isn't actually fully original. Uh, the original minute hand that they put on uh, was really, really highly decorative, but also really heavy. So when they uh, when they put it on and started winding it up and it started ticking round, it was so heavy that gravity was actually dragging it down a bit and not letting it uh, kind of tick round as, as it should. Um, so that was very quickly re replaced. And obviously after that, it's repainted. And uh, we realised that quite a few other areas sort of were sort of touched in as well as they were doing that. So um, so we can actually see that the minute hand is very, very slightly later than than the rest of um, than, than the hour hand and the rest of the, the metal work on there as well. So that kind of gave us a really good idea of everything that came before this layer was original because it came before this minute hand was was replaced. Oh, thank you. That's a fascinating example. Thank you. Um, Rhiannon, um, can you tell us more about what we can see here on the other four uh, pictures as well, please? So this um, uh, visual on the screen is uh, comparing five of the different cross sections. So five little tiny samples of paint taken from across the clock face and from different elevations of the clock face. These all happen to be from the west elevation, but they're looking at the, the numerals, um, then one's looking at the minute hand, and a couple are looking at the sort of the circles, the sort of bands that surround the numerals. And in look, comparing the images like this, um, we can see the various layers of paint. So although there's sort of, you can count sort of maybe 13 layers of paint, there are only actually um, six schemes of decoration because each individual scheme uh, of decoration comprises a primer, an undercoat, 
um, which is usually sort of coarser and a, and a lighter colour and then a, a dark top coat. And in the image that's labelled 17.82, you can sort of see a little ribbon of um, gold leaf, for example, which, um, uh, sorry, in the most leftmost image, on top of the blue, there's a little ribbon of gold, which showed that it, um, the clock face was painted with contrasting dark blue uh, with gilded highlights. But it also shows us the image marked 17.83 in the middle that there's actually numerous layers of um, blue. So th this sort of it wasn't a fleeting scheme of dark blue. It was there were up to sort of three times, maybe four times that it was painted that way. But interestingly, they also get slightly darker each time. So that might indicate that sort of incrementally as as the clock face became slightly more dirty um, with sort of smog and pollution that um, the sort of soot made it appear darker and that gradually it, it's become sort of dark grey, black over time. Yes, all that pollution that we've had, it's understandable. Well, thank you very much indeed. And Rhiannon, um, you previously worked on other projects in the Houses of Parliament. So how did it feel to be asked to work on the Elizabeth Tower one? And what can you tell us about the samples that we can see on the screen now? Um, yes, I mean, I've been lucky enough um, in, in my previous job to um, where I also worked as a, a, an architectural paint researcher and paintings conservator, I was lucky enough to undertake some uh, other um, paint research projects around the parliamentary estate. Um, and uh, of all varying statuses, you know, some sort of quite um, low level sort of service areas, um, to sort of old palace yard, you know, external metalwork and railings, um, and also on some of the interior spaces in the clock tower. But now, um, you know, so when I left and I started working at Lincoln Conservation, and this was one of the first projects um, for me to work on, it was seemed like fate. <laughs> and it's been such a lovely opportunity to work on it and to sort of work on the most sort of iconic uh, part of all. Um, so yeah, that was a, a real um, privilege. Um, specifically, these just looking, you know, you asked me to talk to you a little bit more about these two particular um, samples. Uh, this is just showing, so this image on the right is uh, a repeat of one from the last um, slide that's showing uh, a sample from the metalwork. So at the base of the sample, you can see that sort of red sort of iron oxide uh, and that's this what we call mill scales that's um from the the sort of iron work just traces of that remain in the bottom of the paint whereas the image on the left that is taken from some of the um stonework with the lettering that's underneath the clock dial and you can see um not only uh so on the the first layer of paint uh beneath that you've got uh, that's part of the stone substrate and you can see a uh, build-up of, of paint with the very very thin layers of gilding which are scarcely visible in cross-section even because they're so thin um, but you can also see some quite strong um, uh, dirt layers uh, between the decorative schemes which help gives us clues to sort of uh, which paint layers um, and schemes were uh, exposed for long periods of time before redecoration. Oh, thank you. Well, we're delighted to welcome you back to the Palace of Westminster and particularly this work on the Elizabeth Tower that you've been doing with Philippa. So um, now the last two paint samples have been from uh, stonework and metalwork, but these two on the next slide are both from the metalwork. Tell us a bit more about these. Um, yeah, so again, this uh, you can see these in a little bit more detail here. So these are both um, from the clock face and it's just showing, you know, it, it, it illustrates so clearly um, just how complex each um, scheme of decoration appears in cross section. Um, so, you know, if you imagine yourself decorating in your home you know you often not just apply an undercoat and a top coat but you might need to apply several coats of um, top coat to get good coverage um, and so you you'll see that in cross-section and it, it sort of 
uh, our job is unpicking what we can see and by comparison and, and seeing patterns in the in the layers of stratigraphy we can see when something uh, has occurred at the same point in time and where things have changed this uh, these two particular samples show quite clearly in the penultimate scheme of decoration that uh, although they currently appear the same and black in the scheme before what uh, the sample from the left uh, is is now it was gilded where it's now become black so you can see that bright yellow that was uh, applied underneath the layer of gilding so it, it helps you to show that with each scheme of decoration it's not that the same distribution of color is repeated scheme after scheme and just colors change sometimes something that was gold might just be painted over next time for reasons of economy so um gradually incrementally things slightly change over time and you found that the uh, the blue color was a particular type of blue wasn't it a particular name that it had it's a prussian blue um but yeah the so there are some various varying shades of it you can see in the earlier layers uh, you know that there's that very sort of sky blue almost like a kind of royal blue as an undercoat with this very deep sort of prussian blue on top and then you do have subsequent schemes of it repeating all slightly different shades and then when you get to the middle it's sort of going more of a kind of greeny blue before it sort of becomes these successive layers of of grey and then black oh well thank you it's been amazing to look back in time at the historic layers revealed through your incredible work so let's have a look at another slide because this slide shows a close-up of one of the shields we saw earlier with its black and gold theme and even with the naked eye, you can see some of the flaking paint and layers Philippa and Rhiannon talked about, and even a peak of the original red underneath. Now let's look at the historic paint themes timeline from the mid 1840s to 1984 that Philippa and Rhiannon discovered. This looks so interesting, but I haven't got a clue. So uh, can you tell us more about what we can see here? Philippa, if you'd like to start and then pass to Rhiannon. Yeah, OK, so uh, this is kind of our representation of what um, every single one of those tiny samples can can show us. So uh, we have to kind of go really in depth and microscopic and then look at it on a sort of a bigger picture to kind of make sense of it all. So like if you imagine each paint sample is kind of a tiny piece of a jigsaw and we kind of have to try and try and put that together. Um, so this is what this is doing. So the top row is uh, the paint that was applied at each scheme and the bottom row is how that would look on top of the the scheme that was already there so uh you can see uh for instance the one from the right so i had to do my left and right then uh, the one from the far right so that's that's one before the one we can see now uh on the top image there's only sort of black paint there whereas the bottom image you can see that the paint has come through and that's because at that layer that was just a sort of basically a maintenance coat so uh, none of the gilding was re redone uh, none of the other colors were redone it was just to kind of refresh the black again um, and so uh, so even though only black was applied you can kind of see that the the whole uh, the the rest bits that weren't painted kind of kind of shine through um, so yeah so you can really see how it kind of slowly starts to change and you can also see those times where there's kind of really uh, big restoration so a bit like how we've got now where everything will be completely repainted uh you know we, we'd see that as, as a big main restoration so you can see that was obviously at, at the beginning and then in the middle you've got that kind of real big change from kind of like your blues to your kind of blue grays to your to really changes to the to the black color um and then sort of more towards the the 1980s as well where you then get the the crosses painted sort of uh, black and yellow and green and uh, and the, the gilding and, and the hands change to black so what you can see from this as well is that it's really only been sort of since world war ii that the hands have, have gone black so for you know more than half its life uh, the the clock hands uh, would have would have been sort of blue of, of various colors whether sort of that dark prussian blue or, or a kind of more lighter greeny blue mm -hmm. um so it'd be really interesting to see how this comes in its history that actually the black hands are only kind of a small a small blip in its history as opposed <laughs> to how we see that saw them sort of before this research is you know the the go-to color Thank you, Rihanna. Thank you. Um, well, I just uh, perhaps um, talk about the the George crosses, the red George crosses in in the shields. Um, so 
if you could see the image on the far right hand side as it was prior to this uh, scheme of um, restoration the the shields were um, black crosses on gold shields with with green uh, foliage around but in actual fact we could see in the um, cross sections there were several schemes of red um, and Unfortunately, the, the samples from the, the shields, um, they showed very consistently in all of the samples taken from all four elevations that the paint from the shields had been either stripped or had flaked terribly and had become lost. Um, and so it only actually went back as far as scheme two, but it's obviously a much earlier phase and it has been carried through right up to scheme five. So it has, um, it, it was felt appropriate to return the George Cross to red as it would have been and as it was shown in the Charles Barry sketch. Um, you know, you, you you could think of it as representing the um, the home nation. So you've mm -hmm. England, and there's also the shamrock of um, Ireland, the Scottish thistle, and the Welsh leek. They're all shown in in these shields. Oh, well, thank you very much indeed. It's, it's uh, really interesting to sort of look through all of those. The beautiful, beautiful clock faces over the years. And we can actually see a larger version of, of Scheme 6 in this slide. And you'll remember we saw uh, this in a photograph earlier tonight. Now, if only Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin were still alive to see their vision now made reality, because the fascinating work you've both done has led to Barry's blue paint scheme being reinstated. And now let's see the contrast between the old black scheme, six on the left, and the new beautiful Prussian blue scheme on the right. And here's a closer look, a stunning picture of how all four clock faces will eventually look. Can you see the white shields at the top with their red crosses too? So we've got a few minutes left before we go to questions. So um, Rhiannon and Philippa, you've done some amazing work in this project, but just briefly, if you could tell us what the most challenging part of the project, was there anything that you were, um, weren't expecting? Philippa, over to you first. Yeah, I think uh, one of the most challenging parts, again, is trying to unpick it all. Um, when you first look at the paint layers, um, there's loads of paint layers that are all, all, all over the place, and it's trying to kind of slowly piece things uh, together, understand what's missing, what's there, what uh, belongs as a top coat, what's an undercoat. Um, so yeah, really um, unpicking all of those is, is possibly sort of one of the, the most uh, challenging parts, really. Oh, thank you very much. And Rihanna, what was the most challenging for you? Well, um, as Philippa said, um, it, it was a real challenge trying to sort of um, uh, look at the um, correlation between all of these sort of 158 samples taken across um, all four faces of the clock. Um, and yeah, just kind of trying to work out the the, and, and identify the patterns and also looking at the materials. So, for example, in the first two schemes were very difficult to unpick and they appeared to be um, almost identical. And we couldn't really understand why they would repeat um, two schemes so closely together. And there was, uh, you know, very little uh, difference between them. But then when we looked at them in a UV light, so, a, a, you know, a, a different light source under the microscope, the UV light uh, causes autofluorescence in the paint layers and it tells us about uh, the medium used for the paint. And we could actually see that the first scheme was a lead oil paint, whereas the second scheme had a very distinctive appearance in UV light and appeared sort of starry, almost spangled, uh, which indicated it was a zinc oil paint. And tying that with the understanding of the replacement of the minute hand, this then suddenly made such a lot more sense of the samples that we that we had. Um, so it's just trying to find that little clue that suddenly makes everything make make sense. So uh, yeah, it was it, it was quite a challenge. Um, and also working remotely, not being there to be able to physically retrieve the samples as we normally would. Um, but because uh, as uh, Philip has said earlier, you know, we, we like to examine the surface and the relationship between the paint and the substrate when we take take the samples. But in this instance, um, Clifton, who were working 
at the clock phase, they were able to take the samples, uh, you know, with our instruction and working together, and we were able to uh, produce this fantastic piece of research together. That's brilliant. Well, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to go to the question shortly, but before I do, just want to ask you very briefly, what was your favourite part of the project? Philippa, we saw you looking down a microscope earlier. Was that your favourite part? Yeah, I think I think that's always my favourite part is when you when you get these uh, the samples or when you start collecting the samples, uh, you have no idea what's hidden underneath there. Sometimes you can see kind of like a tiny glint of gold or, or a little sort of like flash of blue or or some sort of clue. But it's only when you start to get them under the microscope and actually start looking that you start building up this picture and actually seeing what's there. So yeah, it's always always kind of like a little bit of a, a hidden reveal and that I always find that most exciting. Um, but also you. seeing kind of like uh, the, Rhiannon talked about how uh, some paint fluoresces differently and seeing that kind of a uh, changing technology as well. So one of my favourite things about historic paint is that uh, it shows you how technology has moved on. So, you know, this Prussian blue, that early blue wouldn't have been, you know, possible or would have been prohibitively expensive if the if um, the Elizabeth Tower was built in the 16th century instead of the 19th. So I love things like that, how the technology changes as, as well as all the kind of surprises you find in there. That's wonderful. And, and Rhiannon, to you, your favourite part of the project before we go to the questions? Uh, uh, well, uh, the, my favourite bit is the bit we haven't seen yet. We're going tomorrow to see, um, the, you know, the reveals, be able to see it in the flesh. So. Uh, you know, having seen it in, in, you know, under the microscope and, and focusing on the detail, it's the reveal and seeing it it, it put into, uh, you know, into practice. So that is my favourite part when we can see it. I'm definitely looking forward to that too. So thank you both so much. I'm going to actually go now to the questions because I'm sure we've got some questions from our audience. So audience, if you just bear with me one second, I just need to go back to the original screen. And while I'm doing that, I must just tell you that um, I asked Philippa and Rhiannon what their favourite colours were. And what did you both tell me? Uh, I think we, we both said blue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just saying that to, to be on brand, which genuinely, I think, uh, yeah. And again, because we look at paint all day, we get really geeky about the type of blue. So I really <laughs> love a, a true ultramarine blue. Uh, yeah, Rhiannon, I think you were the same. Well, like a navy blue. Yeah. Like a navy blue. Well, blue never used to be mine, but after after talking to you both and seeing your wonderful work, it's definitely is now, especially that Prussian blue. So let's let's have a look at these questions here. Um, we have one here from Lawrence. I don't know who of you would like to go first, but maybe if one person can answer each one, depending on your specialities. How do you remove paint layers when there may be artistic paintings underneath? Is that referring to the work at Stowe or for, or for Big Ben? It's probably in general, I think. Probably. OK, well, I, I mean, generally, uh, paint research is commissioned to uh, examine and record the paint layers prior to their possible removal. Uh, and in doing so, when we take the samples and we analyse them, uh, we can see if there are um, finishes like wood graining or sanding or marbling to more complicated things like stenciling or sometimes if you can see wet and in wet paint uh, being mixed in the sample that might indicate to you that there is is a, a decorative scheme. We would never undertake uh, paint removal until we were sure that all of the underlying paint layers um, uh, you know, knowing what they were and the significance of each of those in, in, in particular paint layers. So in the case of um, the paintings at Stowe that I showed you, the, the, the earlier scheme was that, that lovely trompe l'oeil scheme. But I had to look at all of the subsequent paint schemes to check that none of those had any um, significance in their own right. The second scheme happened to be um, uh, plain, but with white banding out to look like a sort of ashlar block work. Um, it obviously wasn't um, completely plain. It had some significance, but was of a lower significance than the primary scheme of wall painting. So it, it, it varies case to case, Lauren, but it's, um, uh, you know, it, it, 
you would always make sure you know what you're dealing with before any paint stripping was done and it'd have to be good reason to justify paint removal. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much for answering that question. And we have one here now from Frank um, who says, I assume that they did not strip back the previous paint when repainting. Did the increased weight cause problems with moving parts and rubbing between close items? I don't know who'd like to try to answer that one. I'll, I'll give that a go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, uh, again, uh, historically, and well, we could see in, in some of in some of the layers, so like like the the crosses, uh, that's the St George crosses and the shields. Uh, there was either some paint removal or, or paint flaking. Um, I think Frank's right. Like uh, historically, paint um, had a lot of lead in it, which is obviously quite heavy, um, and so that does add add some weight. I don't know if it was. Uh, uh, I'm not I'm not a, a structural engineer, so I don't know if the weight of if weight of the paint uh, would significantly significantly kind of a uh, change but um, you can sometimes get quite thick build up but in terms of the the sort of the thickness of the paint um, on here really it was kind of you know a, a couple of millimeters to a centimeter so sort of nothing sort of to, to significantly uh, rub um, and then again in, in terms of where, whenever um, someone's repainting uh, you know the the best way to decorate is to you know make sure that you're making good so that you're not uh, painting over loose paint that's immediately then gonna flake off and you know you've, you've spent all this this time and money redecorating just for it to fall off uh, you know six months later so um, so yeah you but um, again when we're looking at the layers of paint and when we look at all the cross sections um, together we can see the areas that have either kind of you know dropped off or been stripped or, or things like that and the areas that are kind of um, have a more or more thicker and more complete build up and, and strategically as well. Oh, thank you, Philippa. That's a great answer. Um, got quite a few more questions here, so let's see if we can get through a few more. Um, was Pugin's blue a top grade of Prussian blue? Who would like to try for that one? I, it's difficult to say whether it's top grade. I mean, I, I think generally paints used in in architectural painting and house painting are of a, a lower grade or quality than artists' uh, pigments and paints. Um, obviously, if you think of the expense, um, and you can always see in undercoats that they tend to be much uh, more coarse than the uh, more coarsely ground the, the pigments um, in the paint layer um, of, than on a top coat, which would be um, much more richly coloured. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't worry. I think we can see in, in some of the earlier layers. Uh, so uh, what what was kind of the not the very 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 original one, but the kind of the 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 second original, the one after the the minute hand had been replaced, uh, had quite a lot of zinc in it. And uh, again, this was a uh, I mean, zinc paint had been around sort of. Uh, a couple of hundred years beforehand, but it would only sort of really came into its own sort of like a, a, a lithopone and, and, and zinc based paint really came into their own sort of in, in the 19th century. So they were obviously making an effort to uh, to kind of uh, use kind of what, what they saw as the, the best technology at, at that time or, or kind of a, a new technology. Um, but then it did go back to lead, lead based paint as well, which again is a, a tried and tested paint. And uh, really the, the only reason we don't use it is because it's uh, a little bit poisonous, uh, but <laughs> otherwise it makes a perfect paint. So, uh, so, um, and again, Rhiannon talking about the the uh, preparation layers and things like that. So, uh, the, the the kind of uh, the preparation and, and and the skill of of the decorators that that went into it as well was, you know, obviously sort of a um, a, of a relevant quality to the to the um, to the building. Oh, no, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, let's try and get through a few of Now, this is a lovely one, actually, from Anonymous. Um, how does it make your families feel knowing you are working on something so special that would be admired for many years to come? Thank you from me and many of us, says Anonymous. I think we'd all like to thank you. So oh, again, oh. if you could probably each give a brief answer on this and then we'll try and move down to some of the others. So uh, let's start with Rianne on this time. Well, I've got two little boys who until last summer had never been to London and they knew that I had worked uh, on this project and I have been lucky enough to work on some other projects in my former job such as uh, London Bridge and uh, I think whenever they see Big Ben or anything to do with London on the telly they're like mummy have you worked there <laughs> so they do think it's very exciting and Aww. um that does make me feel quite proud yeah and I so it should no, that's wonderful thank you Philippa 
Um, yeah, I mean, when we first started working on it, we weren't really allowed to tell you what, tell anyone for ages. <laughs> no, that's like, a good point. <laughs> uh, something came in the news about a uh, Big Ben restoration. We kind of had to sit there and be like, mm -hmm, yep. Dead. We don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's after that. It's it's really it's obviously really really fun to say. And uh, we have such a weird obscure job um, that it's quite nice to use Big Ben to be like, oh, we did we did this. And especially when uh, you know um, you guys are putting on events that really kind of talk about each person's weird speciality. Um, it's nice that we can we can kind of now explain it a little a little bit better than being like we look at old paint and uh, and people kind of nod at you uh, <laughs> like like uh, yeah the the geeks we are but uh, yeah, yeah so that, I think it's, it's wonderful to be a geek because it's absolutely fascinating so I think you should both be very proud of what you're doing then we've got about five more let's see if we can get through this we've got Frank again who said would the actual paint colors fade before being repainted how do you allow for weathering fading who would like to go with that one yeah, I'll, I'll start off and Brianna can add if I've, I've missed anything. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, paints both uh, both fade. Some pigments are more fugitive than others, so they'll change their colours uh, quicker than others. Um, but also as well uh, with the buildup of, of smog and pollution, and you could see in the paint layers, there is like a, a layer of dirt across some of them, um, as well as kind of uh, wear and tear. So um, when we're looking at, at the colours, um, you we just kind of have to almost, there's there's no sort of real scientific way to say it was definitely faded by X amount because we don't know the amount of sunshine that it had at that time or, or weathering and we don't really, uh, so uh, there's kind of lots of theories of how we could kind of exactly take it back, but really it would always be sort of a guesswork. So we just, we know the, the type of paint that was was made at that time and, and, and go from that. But um, again, I think uh, part of the interesting part of it is it, is, does, it does weather and it does change. And that's part of the, the reason that it, um, gets repainted. If if paint stayed perfect all the time, it, it wouldn't really need to get repainted. So that's really interesting that we can see those changes and allows us to kind of see the different the different themes and the different sort of uh, uh, ways that they wanted to redecorate every time it needed to be. Oh, thank you. I'm actually going to move on to the next question, if you don't mind, because I try and get through these. Um, it, uh, Sue Hyde says, are they taking away all the original layers of paint? Will this affect the telling of the time if the hands are lighter? Rihanna, would you like to tell us about that one? Do you know if they're uh, taking away the original it, it layers? It definitely won't affect the telling of the time because I, I have, when I had been up to uh, visit uh, the clock tower previously and I did, was lucky enough to meet some of the sort of guardians of the clock and I know they have the little careful stack of pennies, don't they? <laughs> to compensate <laughs> for gravity and all sorts of things. So there's absolutely no way it will never not tell the correct time. They have done some stripping, paint stripping of the uh, uh, earlier paint layers. This is uh, partly because, as you can imagine, um, each time you add a paint layer, and it's obviously comprising numerous uh, paint layers, each scheme of decoration, the, the uh, carving and integrate uh, delicate sort of uh, moulding and, and details of the surface could become quite choked by the paint layers um, and also if they're failing so you can reach the sort of critical loading of paint and the, the, the paint layers can sort of break up and, and fail. So I think to ensure its longevity, some paint stripping has happened before it's been repainted and that's partly why paint research is done so it's very accurately recorded all of the archaeology. We, we refer to it as paint archaeology, um, so that all those earlier layers are fully recorded before anything is is, is taken away. Um, so that in the future, in another hundred years time, when somebody's coming back <laughs> to look at the original paints, because it may well get painted again in the future, you just never know. Um, <laughs> and you know, you, you, this exercise might be repeated again in the future. Um, so you never know. <laughs> oh no, that's wonderful. Well, I, I think you've both been fantastic in your answering the questions and uh, everything this evening. So unfortunately, I think we're running out of time to go to all the other questions, but thank you to the audience that asked them. The um, I know Bernadette says, will the blue hands and numerals um, be as visible to people on the street as the black ones? Well, I can definitely tell you, Bernadette, yes, they are. They look absolutely beautiful. And Rhiannon and Philip are going to be able to have a look in person tomorrow. And I think you should uh, <laughs> give yourselves a big round of applause when you see them. 
those beautiful clock faces from your work. So um, to everybody, I'd like to say a massive thank you to Philippa and Rihanna for giving us a really fascinating insight into all the incredible research work you've been doing on the Elizabeth Tower. So thank you so much. Um, we look forward to seeing all the blue colour clock faces in the not too distant future as a result. And thank you to you, our audience, too, for joining us on this talk today and for your wide range of questions. And a big thank you, of course, to our production team behind the scenes and support hosts Isabel, Tom and Kate. And please do check the Parliament website for future talks and tours. And also remember to complete our survey and that you'll get the discount from the shop. So we really look forward to welcoming you back to the UK Parliament in the future. But for now, goodbye. <laughs>